A very good morning, distinguished ladies and a few gentlemen. We are quite out outnumbered. I haven't um, been to a conference um, with so many women. Typically, it's the other way around. So you can imagine how uncomfortable I'm feeling. <laughs> I now know how you feel. Your Excellency, the wife of the Vice President, and all distinguished guests, please permit me to stand on existing protocol. Um, well, uh, I'm, I'm deeply pleased and shocked that you can feel this hall. I've been to many conferences in this hall, and we really struggle to feel it. It doesn't matter which association. I think. <laughs> Uh, the, the, the power of the women to organize can, can never be underestimated. However, while we have come a long way as women of this age, with more opportunities in the workplace and career choices, there seems to be a big problem nonetheless. The problem is simple. Women are not making it to the top in any profession anywhere in the world. And the numbers tell the story quite clearly. About, uh, Olubumi talked about the first president of Ethiopia, um, who is currently the only woman head of state in Africa. Two before her, she also spoke about Liberia and Malawi. Of 190 heads of state in the world, only nine are women. Of all the people in parliaments in the world, only 13% are women. In the corporate world, C-suit jobs and board seats, only 15% are women. There are only two female CEOs of banks in Nigeria. One of them is here. Um, I haven't seen the other one, but there are only two. Um, even in the non-profit world, where you expect more women to be in leadership positions, there are only 20% of women at the top. Last year, 2% of venture capital funding went to startups that were funded by, by, founded by women uh, and this is not surprising, since women comprise just 9% of the decision makers in US venture capital firms. And the numbers have not moved very much since 2002. We also face another problem in that women face tougher choices between professional success and personal fulfillment. A survey in America recently showed that married senior managers, of, of those married senior managers, two thirds are men, uh, two thirds of the men have children, and only one third of the women have children. And I think the, this point is brought home very succinctly by a lady called Verna Myers who is an African-American diversity consultant. And she, she told a very interesting story on a, on a TED talk. I must tell you about Verna. Verna looks very beautiful. Nice streaks of gray in her waxy black hair, neatly combed into an afro. She had a lean, muscular build, accentuated by sleeveless and a clinging dress falling short of the knees to reveal great legs. Beautiful necklace did a lot to, uh, to uh, call attention to that graceful neck. I noticed that because she reminded me of Miss Mamata, my secondary school English teacher on whom I had an incredible crush. <laughs> but that's past now, Mike. 
Anyway, Verna was on a long distance flight and having settled into her seat, the voice of a female pilot came over the public announcement system. Wow, she thought, we women are indeed breaking through the glass ceiling. We are now rocking stratosphere. Yay. So she settled into a book. Not very long after that, the plane took off and went into some turbulence and bumps in the air. The first thought that came to her mind was, I hope this sister can drive this thing. <laughs> and then she caught herself. What bothered her was that this thought would not at all have crossed her mind if the pilot was male. And these are the hidden biases that many of us carry and have been carrying for centuries. We are mentally associated with the male as competent and successful. In the workplace, men seem to be overwhelmingly our default. Rightly or wrongly, we trust the strategic roles to men, cementing stereotypes and prejudices in which we have been schooled over the years. And I usually get this from, from women folk in the workplace. I prefer to hang with the guys because fill in the blank. <laughs> and, and this is who you feel implicitly connected to. That is your default. And I will not blame you because a lot of research on implicit association tests, which measures unconscious bias and taken by over five million people, seem to suggest that our default are indeed men. We need to get out of denial that these stereotypes exist and rather look within and be willing to change ourselves and who we trust and feel connected to. Scientists tell us that instead of denying our gender biases, we should be changing our mental association of who women are by staring and memorizing the faces and names of most awesome women that we know. And that's why I'm showing some faces, not only of men, but awesome women. Uh, uh, what this does is it helps us to dissociate the automatic association that happens in our brains. It helps us to relearn a new awesome trust and break the stereotypes associated with women. When we see a woman in a successful role, say a leading role in a hit movie, our thoughts seem to drift to, hmm, who did she have to sleep with? But we hardly ask that of successful men, like Denzel Washington. I like him, so I give him as an example. Unfortunately, both men and women are guilty of these associations, whether inherent or expressed, whether implicit or explicit. And now, biases are the stories we make up about people before we know who they actually are. But are we going to know them without being willing to embrace them? And this is why we need to get this confirming data that proves that our stereotypes are wrong. While I do not entirely agree with all her viewpoints, I will say I admire the good work done by our own Chimamanda Adichie to greatly move the needle forward in this regard. You like her? Okay, clap for her then. But I don't agree with everything. <laughs> I've read all her books except one, The Thing Around Your Neck 
and that is because I can't seem to find a copy. If you have, please, I'd like to borrow it. So to break that gender divide, we need men, and indeed women too, to work towards our discomfort by expanding our social and professional circles and embracing complete gender diversity in our networks. We need to build the type of relationships that reveal the holistic person and goes against the stereotypes. Wherever we are, ask ourselves, who is here? Who is missing? How many authentic relationships do we have with aspiring young women? How many do we have in the boardrooms and in top management positions? How many do we have in politics? We have seen the statistics, and it's not great. We need to get off the fence and become actors and advocates in this journey of diversity and gender equality. We have to call things out when they are wrong, because the other people who see and perpetrate these stereotypes are our children. They may seem innocent, but they are not brainless. They see and they replicate. Biases are planted and nurtured by none other than ourselves. And by ourselves, I mean the people sitting here in this room. Children are born with a mind that is clean slate. Most of their developing years, they have spent with you. What did you write on those slates? that so strongly reinforces these biases and stereotypes between the genders? Ask yourself that question. What can you do about that? Enough of the problem. I guess the real elephant in the room is, how are we going to fix this? How are we going to reinvent and reinvigorate? I like those two words together. I'll probably adopt it as, my, is it copyrighted? By Wimbase. Well, I make bold the following suggestions. Firstly, stand up to be seen, speak out to be heard. This is a rotary saying. Keep your hands raised. And when I say keep your hands raised, let me illustrate it by a story told by Sheryl Sandberg of Facebook. She tells a story about a talk that she gave. And after that, a young lady in the audience came to see her. The lady was upset. She was upset because Sarah, Cheryl Sandberg has said she was going to take only two questions at a time, two more questions. So this lady's hand was up. And after the two questions, she put her hands down. All the other women put their hands down. But the men kept their hands up. And guess what? Cheryl Sander took more questions. And guess what? They all came from the men. And she didn't even realize that this was what had gone on. And probably this is why the men get ahead. What we fear most is not as much our adversities as our anxieties. What will people say? What will people think? You know, see a lady slip on her high shoes and fall, she gets up and quickly looks around. Who saw me? Not what is broken. <laughs> it's all about the optics. In learning a new language, you are going to make pronunciation mistakes and people will laugh at you. But if you don't, you'll never learn. But because of the anxieties, we don't learn. We don't put ourselves out there. Embrace the mistakes. They are part of learning. Secondly, claim your place at the table. Beyond giving the glory to God, do not look outside yourself to explain your success. I find that women systematically underestimate their own abilities. Look at a woman who's lost her husband of four children. She puts them through school, through university, and you would have thought that she wouldn't have been able to do it when the man was there. But she does it. I know many of them. So, 
This matters because no one gets to the corner office by sitting at the side and not at the table. No one gets the promotion if they do not believe that they deserve their success. Perhaps this is not unrelated to the fact that while success and likability are positively correlated for men, they seem to be negatively correlated for women. I don't know why. People seem to love and be around successful and powerful men who won't like to go and walk around Aliko Dangote. They, however, seem to hold successful men to be difficult bosses and not fun to work with. But guess what? That should be their problem, not yours. You owe yourself to be the best you can be, but certainly not a dollar bill that is liked by everybody. According to the great physicist Albert Einstein, genius is 1% talent and 99% hard work. If you've worked hard for it, enjoy it, sister. You deserve it. <laughs> Let me illustrate this point with someone that is very familiar to us, our lovely sister Serena Williams. And people will say she's a champion because she was coached by her dad. If you watch Serena's interview with a reporter when she was barely 13, you will realize that this cannot be further from the truth. Serena, when she was asked, which tennis great would you like to be like? And she said, no. I want to be the greatest tennis player so that other people will be like me. Yeah, that's what she said. Yes, her daddy coached her. But it's not because her daddy coached her that she became the greatest tennis player. She had it in her. She doesn't have to explain that success. Secondly, make your spouse or your partner a real partner. Even with all the shocking statistics, we seem to be doing much better in the workplace than in our households. In a home where both spouses work, the woman does much more because she comes back from work to cook and do the homework. Probably does the children's homework with them as well. I mean, we need to put more pressure on boys. We, 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 we tend to put more pressure on boys to succeed than girls. We generally do not welcome men in hospitality, in caregiving, or anything that has to do with empathy. I remember when I was a little boy, you cried, something hurt you, and they will quickly shut you down. What's wrong with you? Are you not a man? So we learn to bury our tears, and we bottle it all inside. But it's always going to come out some way or the other. Let them cry, boys or girls. We have the same emotions. Do you notice that when men go for PTA meetings or such events, which have been traditionally performed by women, the women do not talk to him or do not make him feel welcome? I don't know, is it because you are gossiping or? <laughs> they don't embrace him. So uh, he, he feels like a misfit. Uh, even though that choice that he has made goes a long way to alleviate the gender imbalance. So it seems that we're not sure where we want our men. Do we want them with us in the kitchen or out of the kitchen? Just imagine the look on the face of your mom or your mother-in-law when they come to visit and see your husband in the kitchen sweating over a cooking pot. <laughs> because you have a very important assignment to turn in at the office the next day. And guess what? They are women. We have to make it as important a job in the home as it is outside. Because managing the home is indeed a really tough job. I found out when our kids were old enough for my wife to travel and leave us alone. It's impossible. Get them ready for school and all that. I give you kudos. The man should not be seen as a low flyer or a layabout if he opts to do the job at home. We have to learn not to feel ashamed of him if this were the case. 
we have to make it comfortable for both sexes to choose to contribute fully in the workplace or at home. The partners that have understood this, they have a much healthier relationship and perhaps they even have more good sex. Pardon my French. <laughs> Thirdly, do not leave before you leave. I mean, mentally quitting before you actually quit to go and start a family. In other words, keep your foot fully on the gas pedal at work until you are finally decided and ready to leave. Do not start leaning back, shying away from strategic roles because you are planning to get married and start a family. Remember that the thought and the action could be quite far apart. Stay in the zone until you have to go. Even if you get pregnant, it takes nine months for the baby to come, in which time you can begin to wind down. People get married, and the women they get married, they live back. I want to start a family. I want to start to have kids. Yes, it's good. Success is never going to be easy. As Denzel Washington says, fall down seven times, get up eight. Without commitment, you will not start. And without consistency, you will not finish. I will share the trade-offs I made in trying to make an impact and leave my footprints in the science of time and see if any of them works for you. Personally, firstly, I exchange affirmation for accomplishment. I stopped pleasing people. I said it the way I felt it. If, I, if it was no, then it's no. An early no is sometimes better than a delayed one. Secondly, I exchanged security for significance. I changed my attitude towards uncertainty. Sometimes we're locked in a place and we're in a comfort zone. Continuity helps to grow the roots, but change helps to stretch our branches and reach new heights. Thirdly, trading immediate victory for long-term sustainability. I stopped measuring my performance solely in terms of immediate results. Don't look for immediate affirmation, buying things that will make people say, wow. Invest in the things that last. Buy a plot of land, build a house. Um, don't go for summer if you are not in a financial position to do so. It's not compulsory. It's not written in any syllabus. <laughs> what helped me are the three W's. First W, way power. Learn everything about what you're doing. If you're a semi-stress, learn everything about it. Be the best at it, mechanic. Whatever you're doing, learn. There's always opportunity to learn, especially with online now. Learn everything about what you're doing. The second W, willpower. And this speaks to attitude. Go the extra mile even when everybody says it's time to give up. The light may be at the end of that tunnel. The third W, weight power. That speaks to patience. Have patience. Uh, when I was growing up, they used to tell me uh, there is what? Suru Leri. Have patience. Um, and always remember, when you get to the top, to send the elevator down. Believing that a candle loses nothing by lighting other candles, I've gone ahead to set up the Oslo Leadership Academy to mentor entrepreneurs and corporate leaders to scale their businesses geometrically and optimize the jobs they create. I believe that this will enable shared prosperity and a more equitable society. The aim is to empower 200 people each year uh, in order to encourage women to benefit from this empowerment program, we have offered a 30% scholarship to all women registering through Wimbase. 
And Olubumi asked me to speak a little bit about this. I didn't know what to say, so I just put it in a short video. And if it's ready, they can show it. I think it was wonderful, you know, at the beginning I wasn't too sure uh, what to expect, you know, but um, I think it's a smart set of people who want to obviously make a difference in their, in their businesses um, and they, they, they're, they're ready to learn and they're ready to go back to their businesses and add what I hope they have learned from that session. Okay, so the Also Leadership Academy is a mentorship academy, practical, and experiential. The ambience is fantastic. Uh, I was I was uh, surprised to find that a thing like that exists here in Lagos. It's, uh, it's an impressive environment that um, will support conducive. It's quite conducive for senior executives uh, to to do their learning experience. Ideas, innovation, creative thinking does not happen unless the enabling environment and setting, physical setting, you know, is right. Academies like this are very important for improving entrepreneurship. Uh, the moment I saw that it was an avenue for teaching people on uh, entrepreneurship, um, I thought I could identify with that and share my own experience. And so, this is what I brought back from Columbia Business School. I go to Columbia, and I go to teach. And I see the impact that we make in the lives of the executives and the entrepreneurs that come. I've been doing that for 10 years, and they send me messages about the multi-million dollar businesses that they've started, or divisions. And I'm asking myself, why not here? And so, this is what we have put down here. I invite you to take full advantage of this empowerment program. Master class starts on November 12th. You can register to come. Through Winbase, you have a 30% scholarship. In consideration of my passion for gender opportunities, um, I'm also co-facilitating the Sustainable Development Goals Africa Center's 100 Women CEO Mentorship program across 10 African countries. I'm going next week to Kigali. The first one kicks off in Kigali. Nigeria was not on the schedule of countries. Why? I don't know. Never on anything. Um, even though we should be. And so I made a case that if I'm facilitating, and the question is where, I said, don't worry, I have an academy. We'll do it at the academy. So I believe that Nigeria will be on, on the list. I'm an advocate. I believe that a world that has 50% of men and women involved in running countries and businesses will be a better place for us all. Now we should conclude by the following note of caution. The future should be about equal opportunities for both men and women. We don't want to make the same mistake by just flipping the gender. Let's not look 50 years' time and say, let's empower men. They are disempowered. <laughs> we truly need both men and women working together to create a world that works for us all and for our future generations. I hope you are indeed reinvigorated and reinvented. And I charge you now to go out there and be your unstoppable you.